Hello everybody. I'd like to talk to you today about Parashat Masai. In this week's Parsha, Parashat Masai, we learn about the travelings of the Jewish people. From where they went to, from one place to the other for the 40 years that we were travelling through the desert before we came to the land of Israel. And the Parsha goes on to tell us, after telling us all the travellings that we did, how Yeshua ben Nun, the, um, the person who's going to be taking over from Moshe Rabbeinu, who's not going to be allowed to come into the land of Israel, Yeshua ben Nun, who is going to lead the Jewish people in, and he's going to divide up the land of Israel amongst the tribes. Each person is going to get their piece of land. Um, but when, that how Yeshua is going to come in to the land of Israel and divide up the land. Chazal tell us the Gemara and Mesechet Baba Kama is the source for this. How Yeshua ben Nun, when he came into Israel and he divided up the land, he made conditions. He divided up the land between the Jewish people according to certain conditions. What were these conditions? These conditions, if we look through them, they're ways that neighbors are supposed to live together. The Jewish people have been wandering for so many years in the desert and they never owned land. When we were in Egypt, we were slaves, we never owned our own land. When we were wandering through the desert, no land for anybody. Suddenly, when we come to the land of Israel, now we're going to have our own land. The land of Israel will be divided up and each tribe will have a portion. How are we going to live together as neighbors? The Torah didn't really tell us that. Yeshua needed to make conditions on the way that people are going to live together. The Rambam brings these conditions down as halacha. There are more in um, Choshen Mishpat, Simon Reish and Dalid, the halachas of Hefka, the halachas of un unowned property. There, there are more asks. I don't understand why the Shulchan Aruch didn't bring these conditions because all these conditions that Yeshua made, which we're going to see them in a minute, they are all halacha. Not only in Israel, but also in the diaspora. So Yeshua, so the, uh, the, the, the Shulchan Aruch, when he's writing down the halacha, should have mentioned all these things. Maybe, suggests there are more, the reason why he didn't is because at that time the Jews didn't own land. So it wasn't really relevant. But certainly today, when we are landowners, these conditions of Yeshua ben Nun are very important for us to understand and to know when dealing with our neighbors. So let's straight away take a look at these 10 conditions and see what's the underlying understanding, the underlying, the underlying philosophy of these 10 conditions so we can see what does Hashem want from us. The first condition, if you look in my book, Pure Money, volume 2, um, on page 230, we have all the 10 conditions listed. The first condition, anyone may let his light livestock, such as sheep and goats, graze in another's forest of fully grown trees. However, they may not let their heavy livestock, such as cows, graze in such a forest, in a forest with young trees that are not fully grown, even light livestock may not graze. The difference between light livestock, sheep and goats, and heavy livestock, cows and bulls and oxes, are that the large ones can cause damage. So what are we saying here? We're saying that if you have a forest in your portion of land, and I've got sheep, and in your forest there's grass that's growing between the trees that you've got absolutely no use for. So please let my sheep, who are not going to cause you any damage, come in and eat that, those grasses which you have no use for. 
And that's an obligation according to Yeshua, these conditions of Yeshua ben Nun. Even though there's a principle which we have of that in a situation where one person's not going to lose and another person can gain, then there's an obligation from the Torah. We found it in the other places, in, uh, which I won't go into right now, we'll go into that in another shoe. There's an obligation to let the other person enjoy your property, but that's only talking about temporary use, not about taking it forever. Here we're talking about taking it forever, using those grasses to eat as for food. The grasses that are growing between your trees that you have no use for. Here, Yeshua ben Nun is saying, something that you have absolutely no use for, give it to your neighbor and let him benefit from it. As I said, this is not the same as Midat Sodom. In another Shia, we'll explain the differences between the two. But in this today's Shia, I just really want to go over these ten conditions. The second condition, anyone may gather wood from another's field or forest, as long as the wood is still fresh and attached to the ground, but not yet rooted. Other wood may not be collected. I need firewood. This is lousy firewood. It's not stuff that you're going to use. These are things that haven't yet rooted themselves. They're still green. They're not going to burn very well. But seeing as you have no use for them, and they're not going to grow into anything special, let me take them if I need. Same principle again. Something that you have no use for, let me use it. Anyone may pick wild grass and weeds growing anywhere. If you see me coming into your field and picking up wild grass and weeds that you have no use for, you just want to get rid of them anyway. Don't say, hey, you want those? You have to pay me for them because you have no use for them. There's no established market for this stuff. It's not things that people would normally sell. So why make me pay you for it? That's again the same type of underlying philosophy. Help. Help your neighbor. Anyone may pick off a new bud from a plant that is not yet giving fruit, but only from the side of the plant that's in the shade. Because anyway, it's not going to grow into anything. So you've got, again, no use from it. It's your property. You've got absolutely no use for it. Let me use it. Let me benefit from it. Number five, natural resources. Natural resources like a spring belong to everybody. Don't cut it off and just take it for yourself. If it's coming through your land, you can use the water. The person who has the source of that spring in their land can't say, oh, no, 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 you can't take from that my water. Natural resources belong to everybody. And the same thing would apply to natural gas, to natural um, minerals that were found in the ground. Everything is natural resources like these are to be shared with everyone. It doesn't mean necessarily that the person who developed them, the person who found them, the person who's invested money in producing them doesn't have an advantage. Certainly they do. But natural resources are for everybody to benefit from. What about fishing in the Kinneret? A great source of fish. So whoever's portion that fell into, are they going to be able to say, well, if you want to fish in a canary, you have to pay me. No. To bring in trawlers and to trawl out tons of fish every day, that I can't do. The rights to the fishing belong to the person who's got the canary, the tribe that gets the canary, or the person, the family that gets the canary. But if a guy wants to go fishing on a Sunday afternoon with his kids, let him do it. Don't make him pay to have to do that. He's not taking anything away from you. Let him enjoy and benefit from what you have that's not going to cause you any loss. What if someone needs to relieve themselves in your property, in your fields? Allow them to do it. No big deal. Someone who gets lost in your vineyard and they need to climb over everything to get out and they might cause you damage, they might damage something, but the guy needs to get out, he's got lost. Let him get out even if he's going to cause you some very minor damage. Not big damage, minor damage. At times when the public roads and the sidewalks are muddy, in the middle of the winter, when everything is really muddy, the streets are full of mud, 
allow people to take a shortcut through your front garden in order to keep dry. No big deal. Yeah, you're right, you're giving up on something. But that's the way that Hashem wants neighbors to live together. That's what we see from here. And number 10 is that if you find a dead body outside the boundaries of a town, the place where they've fallen, that's the place where you'll bury them. Of course, this is talking about a time when there weren't organized places for burying people. There weren't organized graveyards. Today, when there are, of course, you bury them there. But again, the idea, this is, post, this is here someone who's got no one to look after them. Where are we going to bury them? Everyone's going to be fighting. No, you bury them in your property. No, you bury them in yours. And the poor guy's just, body's going to be rolling around and not buried anywhere. Wherever he falls, that's his. And that's where he should be buried. That's the tenth of these ten conditions of Yeshua ben Nun. Again, what is the philosophy that we can see behind all these conditions? The philosophy that we can see is help your neighbor. For things that aren't going to really cost you anything, be a good guy, let other people benefit from even your own property, like your, these grasses and wood that you don't need and have no use for. Allow them to use and get benefit from them. The Gemara in Masechet Baba Kama, when it speaks about these, mentions another two conditions that were initiated by Rabbi Yochan and Ben Baroka, which are not really included in these ten conditions. And without getting into the halakha right now, there are different opinions as to whether they are halakha or they're not halakha. The Rambam, on the one hand, seems to infer that they are not the halakha. Others infer that they are. But let's again look at these two conditions of Rabbi Yochan and Ben Baroka, which are the Gemara in Masechet Baba Kama brings as a continuation of these ten conditions of Yeshua Ben Nun. The first one, let's say there's two guys walking through the desert and one of them has a barrel of wine and the other has a barrel of honey. The guy with the barrel of, a hun of honey gets a crack in his barrel. So now, slowly, slowly, the honey is dripping and falling and going away and he's going to lose everything. And we have to presume that honey is worth much more than wine. The guy with the wine, his barrel is perfectly okay. So the guy with the barrel of wine says to his friend with the barrel, sorry, the guy with the barrel of honey says to his friend with the barrel of wine, throw away your wine and I'll pay you for it. And let me use your barrel to save my um, honey. The guy says, no, I want my wine. Here, says Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka, it's an obligation on the guy with the barrel of wine to throw out his wine in order to save his friend from losing his honey. What's the underlying principle here? There's two people. One is about to suffer a large loss. He's going to lose all his honey. The other guy can prevent him from losing that large loss if he's prepared to suffer a small loss. What's the small loss? Not throwing out the wine because he's going to get paid for it. But giving up on his wine, he's going to get paid for the wine. There's no doubt about that. He has to pay for the wine. The owner of the honey has to pay for the wine. But throw out your wine, which isn't worth that much, and let's use it to help me from suffering a large loss. Says Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka, it's an obligation. An obligation on the guy with the, who owns the, the wine that he must throw out his wine in order to help his friend say and save him from this large loss of his wine, of his honey, excuse me. Where there are two people and one's going to suffer a large loss and the other a small loss and the guy who's going to suffer a small loss can save the other guy by suffering this small loss. He's obligated to do it. The second one we see along the same lines. The second one talks about a case of a guy who had a, a beehive. His paunosa is raising bees and, and selling their honey. But unfortunately, his bees have decided to go and make their nest, make their beehive on the tree of a neighbor. 
says, um, says the owner of the bees, look, I've tried persuading my bees to come home and they don't seem to want to listen to me. Let me cut off the branch of your tree where they've made their nest and bring them back to save my parnasa. Says the owner of the branch, I don't agree. But you're only going to suffer a large, a small loss. I'm going to pay you for that branch. We'll bring in valuers, whatever that branch is worth, I will pay you for it. But help me and save me from making a large loss. My whole livelihood is dependent on these bees. Here too, Yochanan ben Baroka said it's an obligation, an obligation on the guy that owns the tree to allow the other guy to cut off the branch so that he can save his, himself from the large loss. And of course, he has to pay him for the value of that branch, whatever it is. Here too, we see the same underlying philosophy, the same underlying principle, that where there are two people, one is going to suffer a large loss. Someone else can save them from that loss if they're prepared to suffer a smaller loss. A very small loss. Really just giving up on their ownership, they're going to get paid. Then they're obligated to do it. The same principle as we saw before. It's interesting, in um, the courts in Israel, even though they have no obligation, they don't normally rule according to Jewish law, but there was a case called the Horowitz case, where there was someone, who, an owner of a field, and it was the, the good of everybody that a small sliver, a small corner of his, field, his private field would be taken away to build a public uh, road. And he, of course, objected, and it was his right to object. It's his private road. If you want to build that road, go around my land. You can't go across my land and take it away from me. But on the other hand, we had our conditions of Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka. One guy is going to suffer a small loss. He can, and it's going, to, it's going to save the community from suffering a large loss of having to go around his field, which is going to cost millions and millions of extra shekels. You're obligated to give up. And that's exactly how the courts in Israel ruled. There were three judges there. Two ruled like Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka. The third judge didn't. He said, this is something that the law cannot accept. Secular law cannot accept such a thing that we're going to take away your rights. For any reason, you can't take away somebody else's rights. But here you see that Jewish law is telling you that there are situations, not many, but there are situations where you have a responsibility to everybody because the land, your property, is not yours personally. And even if it was yours personally, you have an obligation to help your neighbor. And here we see a tremendous thing that into Jewish law comes this principle of helping your neighbor. Not just smiling at him and making him a cup of tea, but actually giving up on your property in cases where you can save him from a large loss. That's the philosophy, the principle that's behind these ten conditions of Yeshua ben Nun, which are all, as we said, there are more paskins in Simon Reisha and Dalit in Choshen Mishpat, that these are all halacha lamaase, not just in Israel, even in the diaspora. So let's all try and adopt these ten principles and be better neighbors to each other. Thank you.